Imagine this. Request navigation. Your aircraft has state-of-the-art avionics. Command, stand by. But your map is from the 15th century. Command, please advise, please advise. Neuroscientists are stuck in this harrowing predicament as they try to make their way around the human brain. The first classical map made about a century ago is still widely used today. Published in 1909, it defined regions on the pinkish-gray organ that control our actions and functions. The fundamental unit of brain organization for the cerebral cortex is what we call a cortical area. So on the map, you could say there's a country called speech, another called short-term memory, another hand movement. Identifying every one of these cortical areas became a major objective of the Human Connectome Project, the HCP, leading the effort a master map maker. I consider myself a cortical cartographer. By July of last year, the HCP completed its first phase, a 21st century world map of the brain. We reported the presence of 180 distinct cortical areas. 97 of them were new to brain science. The connectome gives us this opportunity, a really great tool to be able to navigate the human brain. Navigating the brain is more than just naming cities and states. You need to understand the connections between them. The word connectome implies that the fundamentally important thing about brains is connections. This evening, we'll be talking and learning about two different kinds of connections. Structural connections in the brain versus functional connections in the brain. By structural connections, we're really talking about the physical connections. The wires that connect nerve cells. So structural connectivity looks at the regions and the pathways connecting them. The functional connectivity, though, is more about how different parts of the brain work together on an ongoing basis. Brain function arises from conversations that different brain regions are having with each other. A functional map must track living data, conversations flowing through the pathways between brain regions. We collected data from 1,200 individuals. We have them do different tasks in the scanner, things like a memory task, emotions on faces, those same regions of the brain seem to be forming networks. Brain structure is wired by its experience, but we have no idea in what form that wiring diagram has that information. And that's the big puzzle. To see how that translates into individual nerve connections, you need to look much closer than David or Deanna's technology can go. Down to the level of individual neurons. Two quadrillion times smaller. What exactly is two quadrillion times smaller? Well, if the scale of David's brain map is the big picture, equivalent to a map of the whole Earth, then the area that Jeff's covering would be a city about the size of, say, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. That little blur, that little blob there might be Sheboygan, or we're not sure. That little blob is a one millimeter cube of brain tissue, and it contains a staggering number of neurons. 50,000 nerve cells and about 1 billion synapses. So right now, there's no way to model an entire human brain by diagramming its micro-wiring. Scientifically for now, we're lost in the foggy limits of brain science. We would need more digital information than is the actual digital content of the world. We are going to have the most wonderful scientists in the world uh, talk to us about their experience with mapping, with map making, with map conceptualizing, with, with brain understanding. So our first guest is a professor of neurobiology at Washington University in St. Louis, principal investigator for the Human Connectome Project, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's internationally known for his research on the structure function, connectivity, evolution, and development of cerebral cortex in humans and non-human primates. Please welcome David Van Essen. <laughs> Our next participant is a professor of psychological and brain sciences at Washington University, St. Louis, and an investigator with the Human Connectome Project. She's on the scientific board of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and the Stanley Foundation, a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and a member of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. Please welcome Deanna Barch.
Joining us is a professor of molecular and cellular biology and the Ramona Cajal Professor of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, developmental neurobiologist, member of the National Academy of Sciences, Jeff Lickman. Our final guest is an associate professor of psychology at Columbia University and director of the Developmental Effective Neuroscience Laboratory. She's a recipient of the National Institute of Mental Health Biobehavioral Research Awards for Innovative New Sciences, the American Psychological Association's Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology and the Developmental Science Early Career Researcher Prize, Nim Tottenham. Jeff, what's the connect down? Well, on this stage you have four people who would probably have slightly different ideas about what right. the connectome is. That's what we like. Yeah. So from my perspective, uh, the connectome is a project to map the connections between nerve cells at synapses, at the level of synapses, which is doable, but the price we pay is this extraordinary amount of data we need so that doing a cubic millimeter is for us a triumph, and we're not done with a cubic millimeter, I should say. That's 2,000 terabytes of raw data. That's uh, um, not, that's not a zip drive. That's, right. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but in terms of the other realms, and, and maybe you guys can talk about this, a uh, cubic millimeter is your voxel size. That's, that's the smallest <laughs> thing you ever see. Nim, what do you... What do you how, do you, how would you describe the Connectome project to someone who uh, asks you, you know, so what do you do at a party? <laughs> well, I think building on that answer, there's so many levels to address when you're thinking about the connections in the brain. So there's the very, very small levels that have tremendous meaning and contain an incredible amount of information. But then you can also look at more macro levels that we can use with fMRI that tell us about a different level of representation of information within the brain. So it's going to take a lot of data to be able to map out all of those various levels. And Deanna, well, how would you describe the connectome? Well, so I think I would agree with Nim in the sense that there's really connectomes at many levels of analysis, at the level that Jeff is working on, and then at the level that says, okay, all those different cubic millimeters in the brain, how are they wired up and how do they work together, and how do those conversations, to use a term that Nim used, um, kind of support all the different behaviors and, and thinking and emotions that humans are able to do. Um, so I think we really need all of those across all of those scales eventually to really understand the full human connectome. And, and David, would it be fair to say, and I deliberately left you last here, uh, that you're the most macro here? I think it's fair to say that Deanna and Nim and I all work at the very macroscopic level of the luxury of working on the entire brain of living individuals. Um, but we, and the other part of what drives us is the need for as, not only as much information as we can, but as rich across different types of imaging, magnetic resonance imaging is the dominant one that we'll talk about here, but there are also other what we call modalities, uh, magnetoencephalography, electroencephalography, give richer information in the, the rapid time course of the signals they follow, uh, but not as good in the terms of the resolution in space. So all of these in types of information can work hand in glove to give us deeper insights into an incredibly challenging and exciting set of problems. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, you're the, the astronaut in the suit, sort of untethered from the mothership, way <laughs> out there. Um, what inspired you to do the work that you do? Um, you know, the history of neurobiology began with this guy, Cajal, who made this rather remarkable leap of faith from looking at structure that has more or less stood the test of time, this idea of a directional network. And um, I think just as going from Gregor Mendel, Mendel and his peas to the atomic structure of DNA to the human genome, going down and then back up again, I think neurobiology has to do the same thing. We have these ideas that now nerve cells are connected in a wiring diagram, 
That's what Cajal said. And now it's up to our generation and the generations following to get those wiring diagrams, to really know what they are. Many people would say the birth of neuroscience came with the absolutely groundbreaking work of Santiago Ramón y Cajal, a Spanish physician, pathologist, and ultimately neuroscientist who used a technique called the Golgi stain that allowed Cajal to stain brains in ways that very small numbers of nerve cells would be rendered dark and all the other cells would be clear. Cajal was a gifted visual genius. He had ink, a paintbrush, and that's what he did. He just drew pictures on paper. They are absolutely beautiful. And not only beautiful, but he inferred this very dynamic view of the way information flows. But there's a network of cells, and the cells are of various types, and they talk to each other. And he was right, almost always. And it was such a radical idea that Golgi, who invented the stain, absolutely did not believe that that was true. Even at the Nobel Prize, Golgi kept saying that Cajal was an idiot, that he just screwed this up entirely. But uh, time has allowed him to win out here. Um, let's see the tools that you use to get beyond. Okay. So um, the first thing we tried is to, if, Go if the Golgi technique is good and every small subset of cells are labeled black, and you can learn something about the circuits, what if we could see every single cell? And so instead of black, we made every cell a different color. And we called this technique Brainbow. And uh, it's been extraordinarily popular as screensavers uh, for those of you. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's a very powerful technique of labeling every cell a different color. And in certain parts of the nervous system, it really does reveal circuits. But when you get to the cerebral cortex, guess what? There's just so many wires there that you can't actually tell the colors apart because even at the finest level of resolution of the light microscope, there's a picture of those bigger blobs or nerve cells and all that stuff in between, that felt work, are the gazillion wires that attach them and, and you can't resolve them as individuals. So yeah, we have to go to a different technique. So that's plan A, so now plan B uh, is what we're working on now, which is to do this uh, not with light and color, but use electrons, uh, which have a much shorter wavelength and give us the ability to resolve every one of these wires. And the way we do this is we take a block of brain and we fill it with a metal called osmium, and we take that block of brain filled with osmium, that little black spot in there, and then we put it in a plastic, very hard plastic, and we put it on a chuck, and we move it up and down against a diamond knife. That's what's going on in that a second picture. And then from there, uh, out comes one section after another. They're about a thousandth as thick as a human hair. Uh, so we get a thousand per hair thickness. And then we pick them up on a tape, and then we take a picture of each and every one of them with a very high-resolution microscope. And the pictures are 250,000 pixels by 250,000 pixels, each image. And then we have to take 33,333 sections like that to do a cubic millimeter. So that's so why So you it's... take that level of resolution in 2D, and do 33,333 right. to make it 3D. Right, so it's basically a film strip, and you take those pictures and you stack them up, and you get a stack of images that are now a three-dimensional version of the brain, and then you color in the objects using deep convolutional neural nets uh, to generate uh, the structures in the brain. Here is a dendrite of a nerve cell and an axon uh, yeah, talking uh... to that cell. Uh, in green, and, that, and that's one little piece of an area that we did that is just so discouraging. It's so depressing. <laughs> there's just so much stuff <laughs> in these brains. There's 1,500 nerve cells. This is 
three billionths of a mouse brain. Three bill it took us five years to do three billionths of a mouse brain when we started. It's just extraordinary. And a synapse every cubic micron, so there are 1,500 synapses in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I can say this to all four of you, but my really, my response is just, I am not worthy. <laughs> I am not worthy. Um, I mean, do you ever think about how, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, they will look back on this work and... As primitive and stupid. It, it's no, sort of, they... It, it, it's like the early days of genomics when people actually used their thumbs and pipette men to get the DNA sequence of a virus. And now we have these robots who can do a whole genome in a day or two for a few thousand dollars. Uh, we are now back at the virus stage. We're just starting. Nim, um, uh, who, where would you say, in terms of the two parts that we're going to be discussing, functional and structural sort of uh, aspects of the macro brain, um, where are the scientific disagreements within that? Where, what, are the, what are the arguments? What are the big questions? Yeah, I mean, I think when just looking at the people that we have on the panel here, one question that we want to know is, are the, um, are the data that we're getting at the level that Jeff's seeing comparable to the types of level that we're getting with fMRI? And what is fMRI measuring? What, what does that stand for, fMRI? Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So and it's what's the, that taking a picture of? It's the data that gives you the activation patterns on the brain, so what we commonly think of as the blobs on the brain. And is that the pictures of the neuron electricity? So it's not electricity. Um, it is uh, an area of active inquiry to try and understand what is the bold signal. So when you're seeing those colored pictures, what you're getting is a statistical map of um, a signal called BOLD, um, which is giving us an index of where oxygen is being distributed differentially across the brain as the brain is engaging in a particular task. So it's, it's data that presumes that a mapping of blood activity and oxygenated blood activity in the brain is comparable to neuronal and cognitive, no, maybe not cognitive, that's too much to say, but electrochemical activity in the brain. Is that fair to say? Right, it's an inference. We can right. only make an inference with those data. How good is that uh, inference, Jeff? I, the challenge is in one little blob of the fMRI image, you have 50,000 nerve cells and a billion synapses from hundreds of different cell types over many different layers of cerebral cortex. Each part of the cerebral cortex is layered, and there are different kinds of things going on in each layer, and all that is compacted mm -hmm. into a single dot. And on an FMRI image. Yes, yeah. so it is a global average. Uh, you, you know, I, I would say if, if you tried to do the equivalent of an fMRI on the United States, um, you would be looking at energy use in cities, perhaps, and you would Sheboygan, find, you know, Sheboygan, maybe, Sheboygan, that's right, you might be able reason. to get a little bit of Sheboygan data, you'd get more data from bigger cities, and these cities have a lot of energy use in the daytime, they fall off at night, but it's not like nothing is going on, but, but you would not be looking at each individual person or each individual activity, you would be looking at, you know, essentially all the lights on in a particular part of the brain at a particular time. And so you can infer something. I'm, I'm not saying you can't infer something, but it, there is still a chasm, mm -hmm. I think, between the machine that's doing the work, which is very, very intricate, and these rather global macroscopic techniques that can work in a living human brain. I, mm -hmm. if, if you want me to do this to your brain, I have to kill you. So, yeah, that, you know, I, I, I'm scared of you most of all, uh, Jeff, that's, that's for sure. Um, Deanna, fMRI, useful tool, but there's a hu huge horizon beyond it. That's fair to say? Yes. 
And, Absolutely. And David, you would go along with that? We don't need to belabor this point. I also agree strongly, and I would point out that there's another type of information that is very important for the Human Connectome Project and other endeavors, which is we call diffusion imaging and looking at structural connectivity. And that is also a very informative method. It relies on the preferred dif diffusion of water along the length of axons within the white batter is a little bit faster than trying to get across the membranes of each axon. That indirectly informs us about local orientations of fiber bundles that can then be stitched together to estimate long distance connections from one region of gray matter to another. That is also uh, fraught with its own challenges because it's looking at bundles that are crisscrossing one another to uh, reflect the actual reality of brain circuitry. And we can make estimates, but they're not perfect. And so an another of the, the hot debates in the field is what can we infer that we can put confidence in and what do we have to be very careful of and not overinterpret? But I have to say, David, those are some damn pretty pictures. I, I have to say, I love those. Those are great. Why spend so much time and money mapping every single connection if we might never be able to finish it, Jeff? <laughs> you know, there was a, I think everyone probably would agree that the Human Genome Project was worthwhile. Uh, this was a descriptive attempt to get the nucleotide sequence down to every single nucleotide in the DNA of a human being. And when that project was first proposed, there were a lot of people who said, why should we spend all this money to get all this DNA? We know a lot of it is junk DNA. There's a lot of things in there we don't care about. Why do this? This is just going to be impossible to understand. But no one in the scientific community, at least, doubts the extraordinary value of actually having a data set that describes the entire human genome. And not only that, now that we have the way to do it, we can get your genome and my genome, and they're different. And the genome of people who have diseases are a little different. A profound amount of insight has come from generating that data set. And I see connectomics just like I see genomics. It is a way to describe the brain at enough resolution that we can begin to make reasonable hypotheses about how brains of people who have disease are different from brains of people who don't have diseases of the brain, for example. How baby brains are wired differently than adult brains. And old people, even old people who don't have dementia, and my children would count me in this category, are a little different from young people. We're a little more set in our ways. Why is that? Where does that change take place? Where are all our memories stored? There are millions and millions of questions, I think, where this kind of data would be justified. By analogy to the genome, since we were talking about that just a moment ago, how much individual variability do you expect in the connectome? Does that question make sense? Yes, okay. it's a great question. All right. Um, obviously, there are five of us sitting here, and we all have an entirely different set of experiences that have molded us into the adults we are. Uh, people like me believe that information is embedded in our wiring diagrams, so it would be shocking if our wiring diagrams are very similar. Now, it's true also that genomes are not identical, otherwise we would all look the same, uh, which would be scary, I think. But there's no way in which the, the connectome variability would be on the order of chimps have 99% of the same genetic information it that may it appears be, that humans do. I think this is a good question. It may be depending on what level of resolution you look at. Mm -hmm. If you look at the major pathways that connect parts of the brain, things that come out of the bold technique uh, and perhaps out of diffusion tensor imaging, you might find that brains are 90 5% similar. I actually don't know, but it, probably they're quite similar. If you get down to the wiring of a little piece of cerebral cortex, my guess is that you will find substantial differences between the brains of different people. Deanna. Well, I was going to say, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of the glass half empty, glass half full, and I think this is one of the really interesting things that's coming out of the data produced by the Human Connectome Project, because one of our explicit goals was to look at individual differences in brains and relate them to behavior. And I think we're seeing exactly that, that there is remarkable similarity in the sort of basic network structure 
um, at the level of Sheboygan and you know in Chicago and New York, but there are also really interesting individual differences that seem to relate to behavior, including a lot of those sort of high-level cognitive and emotional and you know in uh, motivational behaviors. Um, so I think we're going to see it's both that there's real commonality in, in key structures, but really important individual differences that link to behavior. I think many people use this as a, a strong argument against doing this. Well, if everybody's brain is different, what are you going to learn by doing one brain? And it would be like saying, what could you learn about if every city is different? If or why could... teach all the kids, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> really? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's another example. But, you know, every city is different. But if you studied in detail Paris, I suspect you would get insights that would translate to London and to New York. Uh, David, uh, uh, who inspired you to, to do this work, and what was your original conception of a brain map? I've been fascinated by the cerebral cortex for 40 years, and when I first started working on the problem, I was looking at the visual cortex of an animal model, the macaque monkey. It has a sheet of tissue that is convoluted to get it to fit inside the skull of a monkey. And one of the challenges I faced was that uh, in order to get information about the brain and, and, and the connections, uh, it was necessary to take uh, slices of the brain and look one slice at a time. I was compelled by the analogy with maps of the Earth that two-dimensional maps of a convoluted sheet are very informative. So at that time, I actually used pencil and tracing paper to make uh, crude but useful maps of the visual cortex and then the entire cerebral cortex of the macaque monkey. Uh, I knew this was a job better suited for a computer, and when I moved to Caltech in 1976, we started working on that problem. But it literally took two decades to get the computer horsepower, but more importantly, the algorithms into operational shell shapes for others to lead the way. A number of groups have worked on that effort. So now we can make computerized maps of the monkey cerebral cortex, but more excitingly, of the human cerebral cortex, which is even more complicated and convoluted. When you were kicking around back uh, as a, uh, you know, advanced science student in high school and maybe college, what were the visuals that you could see that uh, would, would show you what the map of the braid or the functionality of the brain supposedly was all about? They were pictures and books, and it's nice that you brought forward Exhibit A, which is the classic century-old map of the human cerebral cortex by the great German anatomist Corbinian Brodmann. This is the 1909 map you were talking That's about. That's exactly in the right. I learned about it in college, and it's still taught today uh, as one representation but it's analogous to maps of the Earth's surface uh, from the mid-16th century, for instance, which were uh, quaint and colorful. Uh, Brodmann, there's a colored version of his. Sure. This is uh, the, the map that he used, and it was actually accurate to this day for a few of the 50 regions that he identified, but there was reason to suspect that this was not the whole story uh, and uh, it's been a century-long endeavor to make better maps of the human cerebral cortex. The Rindenfelderung der Lateralen und Medialen Hemispherigenflasch Dementis. Your German is impeccable. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Mittelung 1907. Um, uh, so getting from these maps, you had to, and you alluded to it a moment ago, really begin to describe the meaning of the folds in the brain, right? That's correct. Uh, I think of the folds of the human cerebral cortex as analogous to the uh, crumpling of the Earth's surface into mountains and valleys and other geographic features. And that's, of course, very important. It's part of the physical substrate for understanding the lay of the land, quite literally. The, the cerebral cortex contains about 16 billion neurons in each individual, and it's the interactions and communications, the local and long distance connections and uh, functions of those neurons that determine what we call the parcels uh, or the cortical areas in the human cortical sheet. So is it the case that uh, in the beginning, um, the brain is smooth, in an embryo? 
in and an then embryo, development, and even into the the first two trimesters of human uh, embryonic fetal development, it's very smooth. Just gets slightly curved in its shape. All right. So this is uh, first trimester, just right. like this, just like this. So no no real crinkling. So there by the by the beginning of the second trimester, things have gotten into uh, you know somewhat curved uh, uh, shape. But in the explosion of cortical growth in the last, the third trimester of human gestation, things get really wild like, and it like crumples this. up like that. Yours is good for one individual, and mine is even more crumpled. So it's pretty severe, so, yes. So like, and so by and the birth, more of this, the more of this. Well, the more that can fit inside the the skull that has to get through the birth canal. That's one of the reasons why we have, um, uh, have to have a highly convoluted cortex to get a pizza-like sheet of tissue for each hemisphere crumpled up to fit inside a compact skull uh, that can get through the birth canal. But by birth, the cortical convolutions are nearly as complex as they are in an adult, even though the, the brain is only one-third the size of an adult brain. It only goes to show how important the brain is in terms of creating more complexity in a confined space, right? Mm -hmm. You're limited in the space. You're unlimited in the level of complexity that you can do. There are other limitations, but this is how the brain solves its own sort of problem of dynamics. Um, Nim, uh, would you say that um, the maps that we have now, the visual sort of tools that we have, now are helping us to pose new questions or answer more questions than they pose? Uh, both, for sure. I mean, I think that as a developmental psychologist, the reason why I came into this is because I was very interested in behavior and where behavior comes from. And being able to get um, some tool that gives us structure and function to attach these behaviors to changes everything. It starts to answer the question that you raised, which is how does the environment get under the skin, so to speak, right? So to use an analogy from the heart, our cardiac tissue is the tissue and our heartbeat is the behavior that's associated with that tissue. So likewise, our brain is the tissue and behavior is the output of that tissue. So if you wanna understand and be able to ask deeper questions about behaviors and where they come from and why am I different from you and why are we similar in other ways, then being able to have this tool changes the game. Deanna. Um can, can you explain for us the great pictures that we have of the twin, identical twin brains? These are identical twins. Well, I think that the twin data actually does a wonderful job of illustrating what Nim talked about in terms of both how the environment gets into the brain and how genetics shape the brain. So when you look at the brains of twins, there are things, um, especially identical twins who share the vast majority, 99% of their genetic makeup, there are clear um, similarities, things that are more similar about those twins than other ones. But, but there are also fascinating differences. That I mean, they don't look identical. I mean, identical no. is not a word I would even begin no, to use. No, because there are also environmental factors that get under the skin and into the brain um, that are going to shape you know, how the brain wires up, how those convolutions are created over time, how, and the twin's behavior will probably follow and be similarly different or the same depending on how much they've experienced the environment differently. And even if you take identical twins, they don't would actually do this, and put them in identical green rooms and fed them identical green food and gave them identical glasses of water at the exact same time every day for eight years, you would still get differences. You would get some differences for sure, yeah. But it would be less. It might be, I mean, that's actually a great question. We don't it's know. It's not a good experiment though, right? right <laughs> We're yeah, not gonna right. do that thank, experiment. Thank you, yeah. um, You know, but I think, you know, obviously the, to the degree that we believe environment also shapes brain development, the more similar the environment, the more likely it is that, you know, those are gonna be shaped in a similar way. Um, but again, we can't really do that experiment to, to deliberately manipulate how similar or not similar the environments are. Go, David. 
But since most of the cortical folding, the development of the convolutions occurs before birth, that's actually occurring in not quite identical, but in the same womb and very similar environmental influences. So the fact that the outcome of, at birth of newborn identical twins, their brains are very different, uh, that tells us that a lot of this is driven by subtle, perhaps epigenetic influences, but, uh, and perhaps small differences in environment lead to perturbations that lead to different folding outcomes. But the other part of I, I, what's important, I think, here is that even though the, the newborn twins or any individual has a relatively a highly convoluted and relatively mature-looking cortex, during the expansion that occurs by a factor of three, especially in early afterbirth postnatal development, uh, the regions that change the most are the regions that we associate it with higher cognitive function. So that's where our plasticity, our ability to learn and develop and uh, emerge with sophisticated concepts like uh, drive this conversation, that's occurring in specialized region of cortex that are more plastic. Uh, they are also more vulnerable to abnormal experience and perturbed uh, development. So th this relationship to disorders and disease uh, comes into play in that regard as well. So in, in, during this rapid period, things such as the autism spectrum might emerge if, because it is such a complemented, complicated and rapid developmental period that is not well understood physiologically. That's correct, uh, although we also know that there is a genetic component of heritability to autism in terms of the likelihood of having an individual, a child, somewhere on that autism spectrum disorder, but it's called a spectrum from good, for good reasons because there's tremendous diversity in many right. ways, and that's where the experience, particularly in early childhood development, is likely to shape uh, the trajectory of individuals and where we desperately want to understand uh, how can we uh, decipher what's going on and perhaps better treat and uh, modify the outcome. Uh, Nim, can you describe, let's extend this developmental discussion, um, because a clock begins, as David was sort of saying, at birth, and there are various kinds of uh, developmental pathways that are that are emerging at different times, and we've started to separate them a little bit and, and really understand uh, what, what race takes place at what time. Yeah, so human brain development is one of the most fascinating things, right? Because we start off, all of us, as a single-celled organism, and then we all go through this miracle of development where we create the most complex three pounds in the universe. And we all do it more or less the same, and yet we all have beautiful individual differences. So where do those come from? So why would Mother Nature go through that whole process? Because that's really inefficient. Metabolically, that's incredibly, arguably inefficient. And the reason is because that gives us what David referred to earlier, of this incredible plasticity during development. So it, it's like throwing a big fishing net out into the ocean and then pulling back what you need. Because when we're new on this planet, when we just land on this planet, we don't know what household we're gonna land in, we don't know what the climate's going to be, we don't know what the language is that we're going to have to learn, and yet we all do it. And so in many ways, in order to understand the mature human brain, you want to understand brain during infancy and childhood, because that's what gives us that end product where we're all exquisitely adapted to our environments in which our brains grew up. But the profile of the adaptation process, the becoming an adult, the maturation, the development of personality, et cetera, is actually a subtractive process. It's, it's a series of progressive and subtractive or regressive processes. So if we look in the back of the brain where the visual cortex is, you see this overshoot that I described and then this pruning away, like you prune your rose bushes, pruning away of the synapses that you, your brain learns it doesn't need. It's so inefficient what two, to what keep those. What, what, are, what are the two functions here that are being looked at? 
So in the, um, in the pinkish line, we're looking in the back of the brain in the okay. visual cortex, and you see that initial increase in synaptic density, of the, the density of the connections, and then you get this pruning back as we get older. And then if you look at that blue line, that's the frontal cortex in the, in the front of the brain. And it does the same thing, but you can see that the whole curve is shifted over. So that's reflecting that we have these processes of increase in synapses and regression that's happening in our brain, but in a hierarchical fashion where we go from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, which really reflects the way that these behaviors emerge over development, right? Professor so we Nim, can, yeah. Uh, it, it, does this mean that evolutionarily, um, cognitively, re, we require visual information to inform our cognitive selves, and so that's why cognitive development might lag behind visual? Right, so brain development makes sense evolutionarily, but also within one individual's lifetime. So first you have your sensory systems coming online because you need to be able to take in information from the environment. Then you've got motor systems to allow you to interact with the environment. And those are necessary prerequisites in order to do all of the cool higher level stuff that we can do, like plan for the future, or fall in love, or regulate our emotions. Or even be blind. I mean, blind people are going through an adaptive process. Right. So we have multiple sensory systems, right? So we have this plasticity early in life where we can shift resources where it suits us best. How does learning multiple languages early on affect brain development. Any knowledge about that? Yeah, the there's idea? a lot of excitement in this area. So one is, just speaks to the, um, the behavior of language, right? So your brain will um, undergo neural Darwinism during development. It learns based on who's being activated, which synapses are being activated or not. Um, if they're being activated, then I'm gonna keep them, and if they're not, then I'm gonna prune them away. So if I'm being exposed to both English and Japanese as a six-month-old, then my brain is gonna hang on to both of those. That, that your, first of all, is Is that your experience? Amazing. Is that your experience? That was not, I, no, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> That in and of itself is amazing, that we're that plastic, right? So, um, so I can't speak Japanese. There are many sounds, phonemes within Japanese that I will never be able to process. But when I was five months old, I could. But my brain decided it didn't need to hang on to those anymore. So that in and of itself is amazing. And then the second thing is there are all these cascading functions, all these cascading benefits that you get. So children who can speak two language, uh, two languages fluently also have this amazing benefit in their prefrontal cortex. So they're able to switch very easily in terms of cognitive functions because they've had a lifetime of switching what languages they're speaking and understanding what the other person is expecting of them in terms I've of also, language. I've also heard, and this is somebody from South Asia who spoke, I think, seven languages. Uh, her experience was that once you get past two, three, four, and five are easy. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. the brain, is that, what, is that what the brain tells you? Right, so the brain starts picking up on what are the common principles that I need to extract from a language. And so as you gather, I guess, three, four, if that's the magic number, then you get a, a broader sense of what are the generalized principles here that you can apply to new languages. So. Yeah, I would say probably the second language is the hardest to learn, and after that, it's like, it's nothing to brag about. Your brain's just feasting on all It's nothing to this. brag about after that, yeah. right? Wow. Oh. John, one thing that's important about that, too, is those effects don't just last through childhood. Mm -hmm. There's evidence that they last your entire life and actually may be protective later in life against things like cognitive decline and even dementia. More work is needed there, but there's a lot of evidence that they have very beneficial, long-lasting effects. Is free will an illusion? In other words, is our brain the be-all and end, now that's the sophisticated, the be-all and end-all to our decision-making. When you get to the connectome, will you be looking at a deterministic image? Anybody want to take that on? I, I would like to because uh, the, one of the great uh, surprises for me when we began actually reconstructing brains at the level of resolution of the wiring diagram is the insane density of wires and synapses in the brain. Uh, it might as well be called free will. 
because it is so darn complicated. And so it's not that you have to find that one place where there's a switch that you're going to throw dice and you're going to go left or right. The whole brain is made up of you know, billions of elements, trillions of synapses, actually, that each have a certain amount of stochastic behavior. So you might as well call this free will. It's, it is free will for us. We believe we have free will. If you look down from an airplane at, the, at New York City at night, you'll see most people on the highways are leaving the city. You look early in the morning, most people are coming in. That doesn't seem like free will to somebody up there. It seems very much like we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do to make the city work. Um, anybody else have to say anything on free will? I agree with Jeff. It is just, uh, it's in our control. What does control mean? That's part of what we want to decipher. Uh, will we ever understand it? Perhaps not. But fundamentally, uh, the richness of brain circuitry uh, gives us, uh, in practical terms, the free will that is our handle on that concept. Do you believe brain data, including but not limited to the connectome, can be faithfully recreated in a von Neumann machine? <laughs> now, a von Neumann machine is something like a Turing machine, a theoretical idea of a computer that would reach a level of complexity that would begin to um, uh, that would begin to uh, behave comparably to what we think of as autonomous. I get this question a lot, that if you get the wiring diagram, aren't you 90% of the way there to having a thinking machine? Uh, the wiring diagram is a static entity at the moment you take it, um, and it doesn't tell you the way information is flowing through those wires. This was one of the great discoveries of neurobiology, this idea that information flows in a directional way through individual nerve cells. That information is often stimulated by things from the outside that are activating your retina or the cells in your ear or your skin. Uh, and none of that is built into these wiring diagrams. That's coming from the outside. And so we don't when we look at the wiring diagram, we don't see what is actually going on. At the level of fMRI, at least you see areas of the brain lighting up. But at this fine level of the way the machine works, we're far from having a way of putting information into those wires in a way that simulates the way actual experience goes into the brain. David, you were going to say something. Do you remember what? It, is your... it was a follow-up to the question about uh, autonomous agents and aut artificial intelligence. And one thing I've learned from uh, my over my scientific career is, you know, n never say never too in, uh, earnestly because some of the things that we're talking about as everyday scientific experiences were out of the realm of what I could even imagine, let alone say that would be possible someday. So. Uh, technology advances are driven by the laws of physics, but they can uh, make uh, profound advances. So Having, some of what we were talking about up here right now were impossible to imagine when you were an undergraduate. That's, that is correct. Even uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, I remember thinking about would there be some way to measure brain activity and talking to experts, and it didn't seem like it was going to go anywhere in the early 1980s. That was lack of vision and insight about how the clever ways into the new technologies could be achieved by uh, physicists and engineers. Uh, but I was also going to come back to the point about uh, artificial intelligence. And many people know about uh, entities like Watson and other extraordinarily sophisticated computers, which in some contexts can do impressively well in communicating uh, with humans and giving the appearance of intelligent thought. And arguably, there is some degree of intelligence there. Uh, I don't think Watson now would be able to sit at this uh, with a fifth chair or sixth chair and carry his or her uh, digital weight in this kind of free-flowing conversation. But I, heard, I that... heard Watson described one time as a combination of the Library of Congress, and uh, Sprinter Usain Bolt. 
uh, running around getting right. source material. Working in a profoundly different way. So will there be versions of artificial intelligence in the future that are dramatically better than Watson? Unquestionably in my mind. Will that ever approach the cleverness and insight and perspective of real human beings having a conversation like this? I personally am on the skeptical side. I wouldn't say impossible, but I'm doubtful. And I think if they are doing it, one of the fascinating challenges is to what degree will computers emulate human-like thought strategies? How, to what extent will they use principles of neural circuitry like Jeff uh, focuses on uh, to process information in ways that emulate the characteristics that Deanna and Nim and I look at in the living human brain. A huge open and exciting question, and it'll be up for the next generation of young scientists to carry that ball forward. How can we continue to develop new synaptic responses as an adult? Yeah. That's the kind of, uh, you know, Jack Lane question, you know, mm -hmm. the... Uh... <laughs> so we, we do, we are. I mean, the fact that we can learn new things, the fact that we can form new memories depends on these microstructural changes happening. Otherwise, we would have no memory. So we have incredible plasticity early in life. It decreases, but it, it never goes away permanently. And some argue that in some areas of the prefrontal cortex, we actually never reach our full mature state because we're constantly exhibiting high levels of plasticity. So, and some of the exciting interventions are um, things like how can exercise boost that even further for individuals who are experiencing cognitive decline? Or how can certain pharmacologic agents boost that plasticity further? Career-changing millennials. Career-changing millennials. <laughs> Sleep. It's that all the things that we know are good for us are probably having an effect on increasing our plasticity. Deanna? Yeah, I was just going to comment on that, that, you know, sleep and, you know, there's fascinating theories about how sleep is a way to sort of clean up synapses so that you can do more the next day. Um, you know, there's fascinating work looking at brain injury and in ways that rehabilitation can help with, um, you know, rewiring the brain. So I think there's a lot of hope that it will continue on. It's, it's less, but it still continues. Jeff? Well, uh, you know, I... I hate to say this because it, it's a downer, but being an old person, and I like to think that I'm infinitely flexible, but I remember when I was young being impressed at how narrow-minded my parents were <laughs> when they were my age. And I have a feeling my children think a little bit about me this way. So although I feel plastic, I think the world is beginning to assume I just always talk about the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I say it's because it's really interesting, but it's probably because all the other things my circuits could have done have been pruned away. <laughs> rust. All we are is rust. <laughs> um, but, I mean, if you took up the violin or something, or... You, I wouldn't. You, you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't end on Jeff. <laughs> David. <laughs> well, I see a lot of younger faces out in the audience, and I would re reiterate the point that you guys are the future. Uh, those of us who are above 50, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, you know, we will continue to work hard and look for opportunities to strengthen in plasticity uh, in healthy aging, we will continue to chip away at the profound impact of brain disorders and diseases, which is a, a scourge of society, and we desperately need better solutions. And uh, we are excited by the interest in, in the brain and neuroscience that's uh, manifested by the wonderful attendance at, the, at this session. And we look forward to future years and reading and learning about the accomplishment of the next generation. So thanks to all. Thank you.